Would you turn with me, please, to Matthew chapter 11? And we'll read that chapter together. Matthew 11, verse 1. After Jesus had finished instructing his 12 disciples, he went from there to teach and preach in the towns of Galilee. When John, who was in prison, heard about the deeds of the Messiah, he sent his disciples to ask him, Are you the one who is to come, or should we expect someone else? Jesus replied, Go back and report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is proclaimed to the poor. Blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me. As John's disciples were leaving, Jesus began to speak to the crowd about John. What did you go out in the wilderness to see? A reed swayed by the wind? If not, what did you go out to see? A man dressed in fine clothes? No, those who wear fine clothes are in king's palaces. Then what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet. This is the one of whom it is written, I will send my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare a way before you. Truly, I tell you, among those born of women, there has not risen anyone greater than John the Baptist. Yet whoever is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has been subjected to violence, and violent people have been raiding it. For all the prophets in the law prophesied until John, and if you are willing to accept it, he is the Elijah who was to come. Whoever has ears... Let them hear. To what can I compare this generation? They are like children sitting in the marketplaces and calling out to others. We played the pipe for you, but you did not dance. We sang a dirge, and you did not mourn. For John came neither eating or drinking, and they say, he is a demon. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, here is a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners, but wisdom is proved right by her deeds. Then Jesus began to denounce the towns in which most of his miracles had been performed because they did not repent. Woe to you, Chorazin! Woe to you, Bethsaida! For if the miracles that were performed in you had been performed in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I tell you, it will be more bearable for Tyre and Sidon on the day of judgment than for you. And you, Capernaum, will you be lifted up to the heavens? No, you will go down to Hades. For if the miracles that were performed in you had been performed in Sodom, it would have remained to this day. But I tell you that it will be more bearable for Sodom on the day of judgment than for you. At that time, Jesus said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and the learned and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for this is what you were pleased to do. <clears throat> All things have been committed to me by my Father. No one knows the Son except the Father. And no one knows the Father except the Son, and those to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Come unto me, all you are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Jesus is an astonishing teacher, isn't he? Because what he does is he actually takes incidents from his daily life and he transforms them into profound teaching, profound challenge, and spiritual victory. 
Let's take a few examples. Think of the woman at the well. That incident started off by Jesus simply asking for a little water and ended with the whole village being right with God. Think of the rich young ruler came to Jesus, asked him a question about eternal life, and he stumbled away in this case because he was not prepared to actually deal with the covetousness that Jesus actually exposed. And we can think of the many healings. Somebody just touching him. Jesus just glancing across the people at the Pool of Siloam. Simple encounters led to miraculous happenings. And this is a passage like that, because in this passage, John, in prison, asks Jesus a question. Are you the Messiah, or should we expect someone else? And we go through Jesus' teaching, and we come to the end, where he calls all people to him. A great, great call of discipleship. The point of this passage, and it's a strange thing that Jesus would do this, but before Jesus actually makes that great call, he deals with the negative responses and the different types of sinning that people um, and unbelief that people are, are, are bound up in. So he makes this point by discussing three responses to himself. Those in danger of stumbling who, and those who are already stumbling, those self-indulgent people and the discontented, and then finally, the unrepentant and the hardened hearts. So should we start with the stumblers? Over and over in the Bible, starting from Isaiah and going right through to the New Testament, we have this notion of a stumbling stone. A stone in your path that makes you stumble. And that is most often related to Jesus and particularly his death because that is a stumbling stone for many, many people. The old Greek word scandalon suggested an actual stone that was stumbling, but it had a much wider meaning as well. And Beth says it's something that trips you up, a source of embarrassment and offense, and something that causes resistance and resentment. Let's look at this example from Romans. <clears throat> Romans 9, 32 to 35 reads, They pursued, being right with God, not by faith, but as it were by works. They stumbled over the stumbling stone, as it is written, See, I lay in Zion a stone that causes people to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. But the one who believes in him will never be put to shame. So Jesus is talking here about the whole legalistic system of the Pharisees. And he says, they've sought to come to God on the basis of laws and principles. And I've come simply requiring faith. And that faith is a stumbling stone to their whole belief system. Let's go back to our passage. Remember, John sends his question to Jesus. Jesus answers and he says, Blessed is anyone who's, who does not stumble on account of me. So he's saying that to John. It's a very strange thing to say to John because he just said that John was probably the greatest man born to women. But he says, Blessed is the one who does not stumble on account of me. So what is he actually saying? He's saying, be careful, John. Don't stumble over me. Don't find me an obstacle or an embarrassment or resentment 
in the way that I bring the kingdom of God into fruition. He sees John's heart and he senses John's insecurity because John has been put in prison. He only had a ministry for a few months and then he's been locked up in prison and he's a bit unsure and Jesus senses that and he quite firm with John on that account. But then he goes and he starts teaching to a wider audience. And in verse 7 he says, to you general populace, when you went out into the wilderness, who did you go out to see? A wishy-washy teacher that is blown back and forth by, by the wind? He says, no, you didn't go and see them. You've got enough of them. If not, reeds blown to and fro by the wind, who, who did you go out and see? A finely dressed man? No, you didn't go out to look at a finely dressed man because you know that such people live in palaces. So who did you go out to see? And Jesus says, you went out to check a real prophet. A real prophet. But what did you do with his message? This is the thing Jesus is saying. What did you do with his message? You twisted it. You stumbled over it. And I'll prove it to you, Jesus says. I'll prove it to you. <clears throat> Look at the attempts in verse 12 to co-opt my kingdom into a political movement. Verse 12 says, From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has been subjected to violence and violent people have been raiding it. We find another instance of this in, in John 6, 14 and 15. I'll read it to you. After the people saw the sign Jesus performed, they began to say, surely this is the prophet who is coming to the world. Jesus, knowing that they intended to come and make him king by force, withdrew again to a mountain by himself. So Jesus wasn't exaggerating when he said, people have been trying to take my kingdom by force. So to this group of people, Jesus says, stop tripping yourselves up over me. Stop forcing your will on my program. Rather come and learn from me. If you've ever had to hike, and not up the north face of Everest, but across a scree slope where pieces of rock have fallen off the cliff and pile up underneath the cliff, you'll know that there's a lot of stumbling to be taken. Because as you walk across those rocks, they don't bed very nicely into each other. They're very, very wobbly. They're slippery. And also, they're at a slope. So as you disrupt that angle of slope, they come slipping down. And that's the picture we have of these stumblers getting onto so not solid rock at all. This, this unstable scree slope. And do you know how much effort and how much hardship it takes to get across that? Because you're slipping, you're sliding, you're falling, you're getting up, you're slipping, you're sliding, you're falling up. Jesus says, is a better path. There's a better path than simply stumbling. Then he turns to the self-indulgent in verses 16 to 19. <clears throat> and he says, this generation is like a group of children in a marketplace playing weddings and funerals. How did the children play weddings and funerals? What they did was, they had home, little homemade flutes and that, and they would play a little happy song, and they'd expect the other children to dance to that. Then they'd switch that, and they'd change it to a funeral type dirge, and then they'd expect the children to process slowly as they do at funerals. But he's saying, but you complained that nobody would dance for you.
trouble with those children is that they were self-indulgent. They expected everyone just to play the game, their game. And this is what Jesus says about the generation. They simply expected God to do whatever they thought God would, needed to do. But self-indulgence goes a bit further than that because in James 4, 2 to 3 we read, you, do not desi- you, you desire but you do not have, so you kill. You covet but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask God, and when you ask, you do not receive because you ask with the wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. In Timothy it says, For the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth to myths. So then, are we surprised about people getting no response from God, of killings and quarrelings and fighting, people only hearing what they want to hear and turning aside to all wonderful and weird teachings. These are all symptoms of self-indulgence. And Jesus says there's a better way than self-indulgence. And then he goes on to those who are never satisfied. Remember in our passage he says, For John came neither eating or drinking, and because of his austere nature they say he had a demon. The son of man came eating and drinking and visiting, and they say he's a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. People, some people want this approach. When they get that approach, they say, no, we want this approach. They're never, ever satisfied. they chronically, chronically discontent. <clears throat> I'd like to give you another example. In Matthew 16, verses 1 and 4, we read, The Pharisees and the Sadducees came to Jesus and tested him by asking him to show them a sign from heaven. Jesus replied, a wicked and adulterous generation looks for a sign, but none will be given except the sign of Jonah. Jesus left them and went away. Now the issue here is, how many more signs did the Pharisees want from Jesus? Jesus' ministry was full of miracles and signs and wonders. How many more did they want? Just before this incident, Jesus had already healed two blind men and a deaf man and healed a paralytic. What more did they want? They, nothing would satisfy them. They went, they went out to please God. They were out to trap Jesus. They were, they'd admit discontent and the sort of malcontent was simply to try and stop Jesus from spoiling their own type of religion. Who do you think is probably the most discontented person in in recent years? One of the people I thought of was, was Helen Keller. Helen Keller had a disease as a baby, and when she was 19 months old, she was deaf and blind. And because of her particular problems, her parents spoiled her rotten. She did exactly what she wanted to do. She was never satisfied what they did for them, and she was a hopeless case. Until um, Annie Sullivan, her teacher, came along, and she tried to instill some discipline in Helen Keller. And do you know that the fights that the two had were so severe that they shocked the whole of North America. That six, between between about six and eight, Helen Keller, she fought, she broke things, she clouted Annie Sullivan black and blue because she couldn't get her way 
and she was totally um, discontented. But there is a better way. But before we get on to the way, let's look at the last group of people that Jesus was actually speaking about. And he was speaking about those with hardened and unrepentant hearts. When Jesus assesses his Galilean ministry <clears throat> in verses 20 to 24, he looks at those towns in which most of his miracles were done, that's what verse 20 says, in which most of his miracles were done. And he singles out three towns for judgment. He singles out Chorazin and Bethsaida. Now, we don't have um, other instances of, of miracles happening in, in Chorazin, but in Bethsaida, Mark tells us that a blind, a blind man was healed and the feeding of the 5,000 took place just outside of that. But Jesus said, Chorazin and Bethsaida, your fate will be worse than that of Tyre and Sidon. And then he takes Capernaum, which was Jesus' headquarters for ministry, and he says, it will be better on Judgment Day for Sodom than for you, Capernaum, because of your hard and unrepentant hearts. Jesus pronounced judgment on that group of people. I was thinking of perhaps the person with the hardest and unrepentant heart in recent times, and I, I thought of Frederick Nietzsche, who seems to have hardened his heart towards God and Christianity. In fact, he hated Christianity. He hated it. And he also coined the phrase, God is dead. And it was a shocking phrase in 1833 when he coined that phrase because nobody before had ever said something like that, at least in public and in writing. He published that. God is dead. So, some clever graffiti artist actually looked at that because the graffiti was all over the world at that stage and came up with an answer. Can you see it on the screen? In 1883, Nietzsche said God was dead, but Nietzsche died in 1900. <laughs> and so, it's quite clear that Nietzsche is the one that's dead, not God. Now, the big point I want to make is that Jesus spent a lot of time <clears throat> unraveling these types of, of unbelief. But he doesn't just make those pronouncements and then turn his back and then walk away. There's still time. He gives an alternative. He gives an alternative to those crowds in the New Testament and he gives that alternative to us as well. Perhaps, sadly, it's too late for Nish, but for us, it's not too late. Jesus says, come to me. If you're stumbling, come. If, you, if you're full of selfishness, discontent, unrepentance, if this is how God has led you to feel heavy and burdened, come. Stop wandering around. Do something. Come not to a creed or a program or a set of rules or something totally impersonal. Come to me and I will deal with you person to person. That's the wonderful thing about this invitation is that it's a personal invitation and Jesus will deal with us person to person. But Jesus isn't referring to a quick glance at him or a five to ten minute encounter with him and then us turning our backs and going away again. Jesus means believe in who I claim to be and what I can do for you. And he explains a bit, a bit more. He says, take my yoke on you. Now, a yoke is a whole way of life. The Jews said, 
or talked about the yoke of the law. So Jesus is actually saying, switch yokes. Switch them. Take my yoke, my easy yoke, which is the one of grace, offers pardon, full righteousness, fellowship with the Trinity, eternal life. Take that yoke in place of that hard and heavy one that just causes you to stumble and to fall, blinds you, frustrates you, hardens your heart, and causes all sorts of conflict. Put that one down and take mine. But Jesus also says, learn from me. That means apprentice yourself to me. Imitate me. It's going to be a long-term commitment. That's what Jesus is talking about. And we know that to be true. Discipleship is an apprenticeship. It's an imitating Christ. It's a long-term commitment. So we, we might ask, how is this any better? Because Jesus is gentle. Jesus is humble. He's a far cry from the demands of the law and the pride and the arrogance and the fighting and the deception that goes with it. And there will be rest, deep soul rest. Peace of conscience, ease of mind, tranquility of soul. Those are the things we're talking about. Now, we mustn't get too sentimental here. <clears throat> this type of discipleship will cost us a tremendous amount in commitment, dying to ourselves, overcoming our particular signature sins, and we can go on. It will, it will demand everything we have, but it will be worth it because it is the way to life and it is the way to fellowship with God. Jesus saw unbelievers, especially in Matthew 9, and he saw them harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. And what was true in Jesus' day is true to us for day, today. Generally, people are continually stumbling over Jesus. They're self-indulgent, fickle, never satisfied, and even sometimes have hardened and unrepented hearts. We can either choose to come to Jesus, be discipled by him, or choose a life apart from Christ. But if we choose that second one, that life apart from Christ, in the words of Dallas Willard, to choose such a life is to choose a life of crushing burdens failures, disappointments, a life caught up in the toils and endless problems, excuse me, that are never resolved. That type of choice will cost us everything, absolutely everything, even our souls. We will be cast on the ash heap of humanity. It will cost us everything. Jesus spends a lot of time going through the dimensions of unbelief before he comes to this call on us to follow him. My plea this morning is that we'll take up this call and we will become his disciples. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we stand before you this morning. You know our hearts completely. And we've heard today your clear call to come to you, to take on your yoke, to learn from you, and be your disciple. Strange enough, in this passage, Lord, you didn't go into too much detail about that. But we ask you now, please, to make us sensitive. 
Maybe we are stumbling over you. Maybe we are self-indulgent or chronically discontented. Maybe we actually have a lot of unbelief and hardened and our hearts are hardened. But we ask you now, please, to help us to make that switch from that heavy, ungainly, horrible, burdensome yoke to the one which is easy and light and will refresh our souls. Father, give us courage. Give us determination. Give us everything we need to follow you. In Jesus' name, amen.